I think to appreciate this treat, we want to take ourselves back to our childhood when we were four or five years old and when we first get that bike. And when we get that bike on the street and we're with our parents or guardians or grandparents and, and we're learning to that. And the sense of accomplishment that we get that when we first get that bike going on those two wheels, I mean, there's thrill, there's that accomplishment that I said, and it's basically all the places we'll go. I mean, we're limitless when we get our bike. And I always sort of hearken back to that time when I think of, you know, bicycles. Um, and it's really almost impossible to be sad on a bike. I don't think I've ever been sad if I've been riding on a bike. Um, and that's sort of what I always think about, uh, you know, getting onto those. One of the most memorable sort of passages that I've come across in the last couple of years actually involved a bike. And it came from an interview that I came across from Steve Jobs in the early 2000s. And he recalled an article that he had read it when he was 12 years old in Scientific America that detailed a study. And the study was about the efficiency of locomotion of all the species on the planet. So it looked at the calories that were exerted for a species to go from point A to point B. And the condor actually came out at the top of the list. So that efficiency of the condor was sort of number one. And humans, you know, the, you know, the crown of creation came way down the list, about third of third at the bottom. But somebody on this project had the imagination to test the efficiency of a human on a bicycle. And the, the, the human blew the sort of condor out of the water. And what Jobs started to think about was that we as humans are tool builders. And that actually forever ingrained in his mind that the computer was a bicycle for the mind. That tools can take us way beyond our abilities that we would have without. Uh, so it's this little aside in mind that I'd like to introduce Team Frontrunner to one of the most efficient cyborgs on the planet in today's luminary. And that's Olympian uh, cyclist Leah Kirchman, uh, who's better known in our circles as Janet Weiss's Neef. Uh, Leah is a living, breathing symbol of the pursuit of dreams and the sheer power of the human spirit. Uh, she was introduced to the sport of cycling at the age of 13, and uh, she actually used it at that time as cross training for her uh, first sport of cross country skiing. Uh, soon after that, uh, Leah was noticed by pro teams and began her professional racing career. Uh, around 2011. In 2014, she became the first Canadian cyclist, male or female, uh, to win all three road national titles. Uh, that same year, she placed third at Le Cour de la Tour de France. Uh, she made her Olympic debut at Rio in 2016, and she's competed at the Commonwealth Games and I believe that the World Championships eight or nine times. Uh, you've won time trials around uh, the world, and I think uh, what I've sort of noticed over the last couple of days is that you're doing a masterful job of really sort of documenting the life of a cyclist on your own official website, which is leahkirchman.com, you know, where she covers training, healthy eating, physical, as well as mental health, and then to what quarantine life looks like in Europe. Um, Leah, I know it's been a tough few months around the globe, and uh, the postponement of the Tokyo Olympics, I'm sure, was a real tough uh, pill to swallow, uh, but as you said in a recent post, that the cobblestone and the pavement isn't going anywhere. So with that in mind, that I want to welcome Leah uh, to our team call to shed uh, some light on a winning life. Great. Wow. Thank you for that brilliant introduction. <laughs> um, yeah, I, was, I guess um, I'll start off with where I am. So I'm, I'm currently in the Netherlands still. Um, you know, I was here training hard with my team and the season should have kicked off in March um, but we drove to the first race and it was cancelled when we got to the hotel and since then everything has been cancelled um, so as of now you know there's talks they're trying to reschedule the season to the fall um, but as with everything in the world right now there's a lot of unknowns um, yeah, this was also supposed to be an Olympic year. Now it's Tokyo 2021. Um, so a lot of changes to deal with as from the athlete's perspective. Um, yeah, but I guess today I just wanted to give you some insight into my life as a pro cyclist and maybe to give some highlights and stories from my past few years here and yeah, some lessons that I've learned uh, as an athlete that are also helping me and to get through this uncertainty. Um, yeah, like Nathan already mentioned, so I grew up in Winnipeg and that's where I first found the sport and started with a super active family. 
And yeah, first into skiing, found cycling as cross training, um, just got really hooked joining this grassroots kids program. Um, you know, I got to mountain bike in the mud. I was beating the boys in the races and I thought that was awesome. So, <laughs> and yeah, at the time, uh, the provincial team coach was this old uh, Polish, this retired pro Polish racer is quite a character. Um, but there was only really a handful of, of female racers at the moment. So he really tried hard to recruit me to get on a road bike as well and was successful in doing so. And I think from the moment I started racing with skiing and cycling that I, I you know, you write down your goals or you're asked to, your coach asks you, to, asks you to write down your goals. And I'd always write like, oh well, yeah, I want to represent Canada in the Olympics and I want to race for a professional team in Europe. Um, but I think at the time I didn't, I don't know, I would write them down, but I don't know if I truly believed they were possible. So instead I was always just focused on what is that next step? How can I be better? You know, what's my weakness? Um, and that kind of helped me progress through the sport. And yeah, it was when... I, I chose to focus primarily on cycling. Yeah, after I, I went at Westford University, I was balancing being on a ski team and university and cycling. And yeah, so I, I decided to go with one sport. Um, and it was a good choice. Yeah, I signed my first pro contract and started off racing in the American scene. Um, and it was, yeah, I definitely made a lot of, a lot of progress there and um kind of by by the time that um the 2016 olympic cycle was coming i felt like i kind of had mastered the Amer american scene um and that in order to really be if i wanted to really be the best cyclist in the world then i had to race the best every single week and in order to do that, then you have to race in Europe. It's, it's really the only way. Um, and cycling is kind of in Europe and in Holland and in Belgium is really like, you, you could compare it to hockey in Canada, you know, where kids are on skates, like the moment they can walk and then you have the best coaches and you have, you're just in this culture that creates great players. Um, so that's what we have or they have in Holland, it's the same thing, but with bikes. And it's just the, yeah, kids are on bikes the moment that they can walk. Um, so they, it just ends up being like this really, it's a, it's a cycling paradise here. <laughs> Everybody's on bikes. Um, and the competitive level is super high. And um, yeah, so it was actually in 2016, so that I moved to, decided to move to Europe. Um, it was definitely a big transition year for me. Um, the, I mean, the Rio Olympics were in 2016, and uh, those were really my dream goal. And I definitely had some disappointment that was driving me. Um, from I was named as the alternate for the London Games, and it was really hard to feel like to be so close, but then to not make it, and then you know, have to refocus for another four years. Um, but instead of, um, you know, being discouraged, then I used that as fuel to be better and, you know, devised a plan with my coach on how I could become a better rider. How could I target those weaknesses and um, basically prove myself as, as Canada's top rider and that there, I didn't want there to be a question that I should be on the team. It should just be so obvious <laughs> that uh, that's how I wanted to earn my spot. So that was kind of what drove me to make this decision, then to move to Europe. Um, at the time, it felt like a big risk because, um, you know, to change, it was five months, I guess, before the final selection for the team. And this would mean changing basically everything. So I would have a new coach, uh, new teammates, new program structure, be moving to a new country, uh, be doing new races. 
like all of these things in one and then doing that right before the Olympics. Um, but I decided that it was worth the risk and either it would be really terrible and <laughs> totally backfire or this is what could help me reach that next level. And I guess it is good to also give some background, like why, so I explained the culture of making that transition and like why, why is it so hard for North Americans to master the European racing? And if there is like that develop, first that development gap of like, we just don't start at the same age. <laughs> um, but then there's, it's almost like a different sport in some ways over here. So, like, and usually the gap isn't, it's not so physical. Everyone can train to be really strong, um, but it's like the technical and the tactical aspects of it. And so one difference is like the roads here are tiny. Like the roads are the size of a bike path. And you would think, how can a car fit on this road? Mm -hmm. um, and they, yeah, they race on things like cobblestones. I think that's fun. <laughs> um, you know, there's a ton of road furniture. So ironically, the things that make being a pedestrian and being a cyclist normally safe in Europe actually make it really dangerous for racing. So, you know, you're constantly coming into these towns and there's roundabouts and poles and flower pots and like things that you don't want to hit on your bike. Um, so you have to be extra like aware of these things compared to in North America, you know, there's big, wide, straight roads, like not normally safe for pedestrians and, and cyclists, but very safe for racing. Um, so since the roads are so small and there's way more racers, um, it's all about, you know, fighting for your position onto that bike path. And, um, you know, there's 200 riders trying to dodging all these things and trying to make it there because then the climb is coming and is a real art to knowing how to even ride in a peloton like that safely and to be there in the right moment at the right time. So it's, yeah, it's a big challenge when you're not used to that style. And yeah, there's, there, it can also be super hard. Like you have, <laughs> there's one experience that most um North Americans have also had and that's it's very ruthless like if you how to describe this um if you if you miss those moments and you find yourself at the back and say you're dropped out of the back of the race then um it could be that you're actually just in the middle of nowhere and you don't know where you are and there so a race sometimes Sometimes you have a race on a circuit and sometimes you have a race and it's just a big, big uh, a big loop in the country and then goes back to a city. Um, but, you know, they, they do a rolling closure and there's motorbikes ahead and behind, but then they open it again and it's just life goes on behind you. But if you're dropped at the back of the race, then you're just suddenly like on your own. And you could be 50 kilometers away from like the Finnish town and you don't know how to speak the language of the country you're in or you don't know where you are. Um, so that happened to me one time and then I vowed that that was the best motivation to never get dropped again. <laughs> and this is, it sounds crazy, but this happens to almost every North American rider that comes to Europe. At one time, they're lost somewhere in the middle of a country. I have no idea where they are. So, <laughs> yeah. So things like that. It's just like you need time and experience to learn how to succeed in, in these races because they're just so hard and so different. Um, so yeah, so coming back to then that transition of really diving in with this team and embracing it. Um, yeah, it ended up being a really good move for me. Um, I found a team that kind of functioned like I already thought and acted as an athlete. Uh, so our team's tagline is keep challenging. And this, they truly do live it where we're always trying to, you know, develop the individual. We're trying to develop the team, but then also trying to 
you know, improve the sport, like at all different levels. We're just always trying to push to, to be better. Um, yeah, I did have to get used to some things like moving to Holland. Um, I don't know if you have some Dutch friends or you've been here, uh, you may have picked up on like Dutch directness. Um, it's very, the, the, Coming in as a Canadian, it can be a little bit hard because Canadians are mostly very nice and polite, um, even when delivering criticism. It's normally in a kind of a nice way, um, but the Dutch will just straight up tell you what you think, what they think, um, which is a bit shocking at first. But then you realize it's actually very useful to communicate in that way. So I've also tried to be more direct in my communication <laughs> since then, at least to them. Uh, yeah, so after yeah, kind of embracing this team, um, I found myself one of the most consistent riders uh, that season and finished second in the Women's World Tour cir Circuit. Um, yeah, I managed to secure my first ever European victory, and I did achieve that goal of representing Canada at the Olympics. And yeah, that was really a dream come true, and it was a guiding force, I think, for every decision I made since I started to compete for Manitoba. So that was really cool. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And um, yeah, so I've been, I'm still with the same team, so Team Sunweb, and I just actually signed a two-year contract extension. So I'm really happy in this environment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I also love that the team sets the bar for equality in terms of their support for both a men's and a women's team. And we do interact with the men's team quite often and we all have access to the same resources. And this is, in cycling, something that is very frustrating is that there is a lot of inequality um, that happens and just traditionally it's been a male dominated sport. And so um, the women have really had to fight to um, be recognized it's at the same level and um, but in the span of my career now I've, I've noticed amazing change and positive positive change and I think that it's a really exciting time actually for women's sport in general so I hope I think it will it will continue even with this this challenging time now uh, yeah so within the last few years with the team um, I got to feel a lot of different roles. So cycling is really interesting that it is such a team sport, but then really only one rider stands on the podium in the end. Um, and it's, it seems strange, like, you know, in, in hockey or, or in other sport, then if the team wins, then the whole team gets a medal and the whole team like is celebrated. Um, so it's a bit strange. But there is one discipline within cycling that is the exception, and that's the team time trial. And the team time trial is where you have six riders and you basically ride a course as fast as possible for the fastest time as your team. And then everybody starts at intervals. Um, and it can be like the most magnificent uh, event and also the most terrible because when everything works well and a team is perfectly balanced and you know you're using each other's strengths and your weaknesses, then it feels like you can be a machine and it's like so smooth. But then it's like the worst event ever when things are out of sync and if you're the weakest rider or you're not feeling good and um, it's just, it's, you can't wait for it to be over. Um, and in the worst case scenario, there, you know, crashes are a risk and they're really catastrophic when they happen. Um, because in this event, like you're riding in a time trial bike, which is a special bike that's really aerodynamic. Your hands are here normally, your brakes are here. So your hands are nowhere near your brakes and you're riding like centimeters away from the person in front of you. So you actually have to have total trust in that first person in the lineup to be your eyes on the road and to avoid anything that's coming to take good lines um, because if you're behind you you have no control anymore and 
yeah, I did. So I've had experiences on both extremes in this particular event. Um, so I had, yeah, I definitely had to overcome some some challenges after um, in 2015, as my team spent an entire season actually um, training for for the world championships in this discipline. It was our big goal. And then the day before the event, we had a huge crash in training on the course and it resulted in concussions and broken bones and we couldn't compete as 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 our team well we we did the next day but we didn't even have a full team and we you know the whole season really felt like it was lost just in one one mistake um so yeah after this then every time I had to train this discipline. I think I had a lot of fear um, because I never wanted to experience something catastrophic like that again. Just seeing your friends, your teammates on the ground and in pain, and it's that's really hard. Um, so yeah, a few years later, then then my team now um, had a lot of strong riders, and we decided that would be that particular event was going to be our focus for the year again so yeah for me I definitely had to work through that fear and um regain the trust I guess in in who I was riding with and um luckily it did get better the more and more we did it then you know the more you can overcome I guess something that's a fear and you slowly replace it with more positive experiences um yeah and for that our team that year so we i think our advantage going into the world championships we were definitely a dark horse we didn't podium in any of the races of this event that season at all um but we had this chemistry that i think other teams didn't um and yeah that we were racing in norway and i think just that day something about it we were just totally in balance so we per rode the course perfectly we balanced each other's strengths and weaknesses um and it almost felt like easy but mm -hmm. we were all maximum heart rate so it wasn't easy but yeah. something when it's all in sync it feels easy um yeah and then we won the world championships so it was definitely yeah that was a huge victory and definitely one of the most special moments in my career um just re like really celebrating with your whole team on the podium um, and then to top it off our our men's team actually won the worlds later that day and in, in a similar way and we're also underdogs so yeah it was kind of one of those magic moments <laughs> in sport i'd say and you get very few moments like that where um you know everything comes together and um but i think they they help you kind of reflect on challenges you've overcome you know to get to that point and it's a, a moment to celebrate and remember so yeah so back to the season um yeah like i said i was working hard towards the next olympic cycle which is supposed to be this year um, but now everything is, is quite uncertain as we don't really know what, what the next race will be. Um, but I think, yeah, reflecting on, on my journey to now has, has definitely helped and put this time in perspective. Um, you know, for me, I think the, my greatest growth and progress as an athlete and a person have come from really challenging times. You know, like being not selected to teams and dealing with injuries and dealing with challenging setbacks. Um, so when you take those things, they can be used as fuel when seen in, with the right mindset. So, yeah, I like to say that there, there really is opportunity in every obstacle you encounter and that you really can't control a lot of what happens to you, but you always control your reaction um so yeah so in the cycling world it is a really challenging time um you know cycling relies on a sponsorship model and many companies are really suffering right now um and teams also 
just a, in general, the the structure was struggling a little bit beforehand. You know, teams don't make television revenue. We also don't make ticket sales revenue. Um, so while there is a lot at risk right now in the sport, I think there's also a real opportunity to kind of reinvent the sport in a better and more sustainable way. Um, and yeah, we were chatting earlier that, you know, you already see some new things being tested, like everyone's getting really into e-racing now. So that could be a, a really big new thing in cycling. And um, yeah, I think it's also, this is also an opportunity for, for women's sport to just keep growing and, and also just be creative in how we want to um, exist and thrive in, in the world as it changes. So, and it, when I was reading about your company, I also was happy to see that you really are seeing, or yeah, seeing the opportunity in, in this obstacle. So seeing how you are um, just using your technology to now display health messaging is a great example and something really cool. Um, yeah, so great job <laughs> stepping up to help the community in the ways that you can. And um, yeah, and I'm sure as a, a company, you also know that the landscape is changing and, you know, it's creating totally different opportunities in your industry. So it's yeah. just keeping your eyes open and, and um, looking for those opportunities. So thanks for listening to my story. Sure. <laughs> something interesting and yeah. I'm okay. Hey, Leah, can I ask a question? Yeah, I was going to say if anybody so, has so Janet and Nathan know my daughter. Like I get the Dutch thing because I know I've bought a few horses over in Holland, so I understand the the humor and how direct they are. But um, you know, my daughter is is ridden for the national team, and and she's struggling to kind of get up to that next level, the Olympian level. So I'd love to get some impact, like some advice on when you feel like you're getting your face pounded in. Um, what what do you do? That's number one probably already know the answer but i want to hear it from an athlete as opposed to a dad and then secondly is 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 cycling a very elitist sport meaning um you know if someone shows up with all the money like you'd talk about sponsorship are they creating their own team type of thing where you know if you're if you're really good but someone shows up with a little bit more money that that person might get the number one ride um on a team mm. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, for your daughter, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it, if, if you can maybe help her um, kind of reframe her challenges, mm -hmm. like, like I said, like trying to reframe them, where it's like these are, these challenges are opportunities for growth and improvement um and maybe um yeah it could be helpful for to for her to also discuss those kinds of things with does she work with a coach or? yeah she yeah she does she does okay um and even working with a like a sports psychologist can also be really helpful just in, in helping to um definitely focus your mindset that's something that's helped me a lot okay um but that's, yeah, it's tough because you also, as a parent, I think, like the, I think for lasting motivation in the sport, like the drive also has to come from within the, the athlete. Yeah. And um, it can't just come from external pressure. Um, so, yeah, but I think, I think encouraging her to, to try to see like those, those challenges is something that, that can make her better. Cool. Yeah. And then uh, cycling and elite sport. Um, yeah, it's tough. I think it's it is a tough sport when you're starting out. That I think it does kind of favor. It's it's hard to get into it for families that that can't support their kids as well. With it can be expensive with mm -hmm. the travel and equipment and things like that. And um, but I think at the higher levels, then. I mean, a lot of teams are signing riders on on ability. They they want to sign the the best riders. Um, okay. So I wouldn't say you can necessarily buy your way onto a team. 
Um, I think good teams are, are recruiting riders based on their talent. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Well, I have one. Um, uh, I, I, it's, I got one too. Huh? Okay, go ahead, Maddie. Oh, you go, you go, you go first. Yeah, so it's it's so interesting to sort of get this lens on sort of the heart and mind of a, of a champion and the fact that you, even if it was for a weekend or a short period of time, were the best in the world. That's something. It must be sort of such a special feeling. And I mean, on the topic of the Olympics, like there's most of those athletes are going into the Olympics knowing that they're they don't stand a chance to medal. I mean, there's just that much of a differentiation, but they still do it anyway. And so as you're going through your talk today, I'm obviously seeing these parallels between business and, and sport and professional uh, and Olympic sport. I mean, you, you talked about being in and out of sync on the team. You know, you spoke to how it's a team sport, but there are these periods of time for the, the leader, the individual to shine. You know, you have your good days and the bad days, uh, but also you spoke to the business of sport and that how just in the blink of an eye, you open up and, and uh, your, your life is, is different, you know, forever. And so sort of with all of that in mind, um, we sort of build our day on small wins because that's all you have. And what's a day in the life of Leah sort of look like? You know, what does the small wins repeated that actually created a champion? Um, is it a regimented day during the training season? Um, and maybe just detail what that day looks like. Yeah, sure. Um... No, I really like that approach, and I, I also see the parallel back to sport um, where you're talking about small wins because I think that is, um, yeah, how you – it's not focusing, I think, on, like, the total end goal, like like the Olympics that, that, that gets you there, but it is, like, all those small steps that add up and then lead to that progress, and then eventually you – it's, yeah, you don't even maybe realize that the progress has been made, but you've been making progress the whole time. And then you eventually just, um, you might end up at a higher level. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so my day, uh, yeah, I guess I do um, like to have small, yeah, things that give me small <laughs> satisfaction during the day. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah, as an athlete, I think I really like to stick to routines um, because I find when something, if I can get a, a good routine to stick, then it's like, it takes less mental power for me to do it every single day. But if I have to make the conscious decision to do it every day, then that's much harder. <laughs> um, so yeah, things that are important for me, I guess are doing first thing in the morning. Um, I started reading in the morning because it's very quiet and I like to read and nothing is distracting. Um, but then I always do like my stretching and activation. So getting my body ready for training for the day. Um, yeah, I'll have a good breakfast and then I'll do my training. Um, and I really like when there's kinds of specific intervals to do and then, you know, accomplishing those things and following a plan then gives you that feeling like once it's done, I feel like that's a check mark. Like I've, I've had a small win for the day, I've done my training. And then afterwards, yeah, the first focus is on recovery, of course. Um, so getting in a good recovery meal right away. Um, maybe I'll take a nap or something because <laughs> napping is really good sometimes i'm good at it sometimes i'm bad um and then also getting in more more stretching and more focusing more on the the recovery side of things um yeah it depends kind of when sometimes i have two works at workouts a day um so maybe i also do a strength session or something like that um normally have to do some sponsor kinds of things during the day um yeah any kind of social media work or something for the team or maybe for the national team um yeah have some dinner um <laughs> what else i guess at the at the end of the day um something 
that I started doing last year. It was actually when I got an injury and then I was trying to do more kind of self-care, health and wellness things as I started writing, actually writing like a gratitude kind of diary at the end of the day. Um, and that's something I continued and actually I really like it. I would recommend it if, um, if, if you were looking for something new to try. Um, because after doing it now for a few months, then I now look, can look back and then you end up with this book full of like, like small things in your life that maybe you would have forgotten or yeah, it's like a book of great things. So um, that would be like a basic yes. <laughs> daily schedule. <laughs> yeah, sounds like a day and all about that routine. I think, you know, in, in this COVID reality, I mean, the, the routines have kicked in and, and if, if you can sort of make that as part of your day to day, success will come on the back end. Maddie, I know you had a question. Yeah, quick one. Um, thanks, Leah. That was awesome. Uh, it was really cool to hear your story. One of the, the um, sort of scenarios that caught me that I thought was really interesting, especially in lead up to knowing how dangerous the courses are and how much you know obstacles are in the way, was when you were describing being centimeters behind somebody and having to just tuck in and have that full confidence that they're seeing for you and that you have trust in the leader to be able to funnel in behind. Um, and I, I, again, I'm drawing parallels to, to business. What are some of the things that, you know, off the track you're doing with your team or you're, you know, doing to build that trust to where, when you saddle up and you're, you're in that moment, you have that full confidence to just funnel right in and, and, and settle in behind them. Yeah, it's a, a great question. Um, and yeah, I think it is there is so much opportunity to build that trust and that teamwork off the bike. And that's almost more important because you can't really build it so easily once you're, you're in the race, like it needs to be there beforehand. Um, but yeah, I think just as a team, we, we spend quite a lot of time together and I probably see my teammates more than my family, definitely see them more than my family. And some of us live together. Um, so I think just, just yeah number one just spending a quantity of time together um where we really get to know each other's strengths and weaknesses and personalities and um you know what somebody's motivation is um and both like both uh, mental strengths and weaknesses and say like physical strengths and weaknesses um that yeah, then you know, it's like, oh, I'm really good at that. And that person, maybe I need to help them with that area. But then, yeah, together we'll be stronger. Um, yeah, so I think just uh, spending a lot of time and then also doing all that preparation work beforehand. So, you know, if we're all, um, you know, studying the courses together and doing all that, putting in all that work and then coming together, even just sitting down and, you know, I trust that the, the rest of my team, you know, has the same knowledge of the course and has put in the same amount of work and cares just as much about this as me, then I think it really helps to build that kind of trust that you need. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> well, I know we're coming up on the hour. Um, certainly on the topic of gratitude, grateful for your time today. Um, starting it out with a champion, you know, never hurts to sort of go into the day uh, full tilt um, and get some flow state going. So appreciative, obviously, of your time. And it is a day of winning. Uh, we're actually following it up this afternoon. It's our first ever double luminary day. Uh, we have an NBA champion uh, who's speaking to us this afternoon uh, on his transition into business. So a great Friday indeed. Um, thank you for kickstarting it. You know, wishing you luck with the upcoming season if, if it happens. Uh, and if it's not, maybe you can get into that virtual racing and, 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 and start kicking butt there too. So uh, know from the bottom of our heart that uh, we've been looking forward to this for quite some time. Uh, Janet is your biggest fan, if you don't know that already. Um, and uh, we'll let you get on to a, a beautiful evening in, in Holland. Great. No, Great. thanks. Thanks for having me, and it, it was nice to meet everyone. Hey, Leah, you're a rock star. That was amazing. Take care. <laughs> Thanks, Good luck. Leah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.